Welcome back to Watchbox Reviews. If you're looking for watches live, you are in the right place. It's the only show we have on this channel. Okay, friends from around the world, you're streaming in right now. Let me acknowledge the first few in our box, but remind you that tonight I have got a full table. So I'm going to do my best to interact, but Jason Main, as ever, will be my man in the live chat box. Okay, let's start off with that which I have promised you. I promised you the Rolex Big 3, and I'm leading off with it. You guys know my Zin Easy M11. That should be a surprise to absolutely no one. Let's start, I don't know what order we're gonna do these. Let's start with the order that they debuted, okay? I think that's fair. Let's start with the Rolex Submariner, launched in 1953, arguably the Rolex, and launched in the version you see here for Basel World 2010. Now when this watch first bowed, 40 millimeters stainless steel, super case Rolex sub, it's the 116610 LV lunette there. It is the Descendant of the Kermit, it is nicknamed the Hulk, but this dial was described by Rolex as green gold, and frankly, it lives up to the moniker. There is something almost supernatural or self-animated about this dial. It has a dynamism, it has a reflectivity, it has an explosive tendency in broad daylight that is shared with no other Submariner, past or present. It's a special watch, and you can see why, with a metallic dial and a gloss green bezel, this is probably the most in-demand of the steel subs at the moment, which is to say it's the most in demand of the subs. I can see Kevin Z, D. Fitzgerald, Bear Clooney watches, first man in the box, Eddie Landsberg, Michael G, Andrew, Joe Differ. I can see Andrew, ST12, Matt Foster, Jack Purcell, True Lie joining in. Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate all of you. Let's throw the sub on the wrist. We're talking about the Hulk. We're talking about the big three, GMT, Submariner, and Daytona. I've picked my favorite versions of the current watches. And I, we'll see what you think. You guys let me know. What would you take? Submariner, GMT, or Daytona? Not get it to sell it, but get it to wear it. Which of the three would you want? I think of the watches on the table tonight, I'd lean sub, although the Daytona is going to test my fidelity to that green bezel. You guys know I love green. All right. Now, the Daytona. Uh, the Daytona is the last. We're going to go with the GMT, which bowed back in late 1954 for 1955. We're going to go with the watch of Basel World 2018. This is the 126710BLRO, the first of the stainless steel Pepsi bezels. Now, the timepiece features a Jubilee bracelet, which means it brings back the Jubilee. For most of the history of the GMT Master, right up until the Super Cases, the Jubilee was always a option, a minority option rarely seen, but always on the table. Now, the timepiece here wears it exclusively. You cannot get this watch with an Oyster bracelet. I'm thinking a Coke bezel might be coming with the three-day movement in this watch and an oyster bracelet at Basel World 2019. I'm gonna throw this one on the wrist. The thing about the Jubilee is that it does pivot toward the dress watch side of the spectrum. It's something you expect to see on a date just. It's something you expect to see on occasion on a president. On a sports watch, a true rotating bezel Rolex sports watch, it creates a very versatile and comfortable aesthetic. The thing about the Jubilee is since the 2005 Super Jubilee, it's had solid center links. It's been robust enough to serve as your sports watch bracelet. It also has much bigger gaps between the links, so it's more comfortable and it vents the wrist better. All this water resistant to 100 meters. You can absolutely make this your all the time watch, and for a lot of folks, this will be the one they choose, with the second time zone being a very useful function whether you travel or simply know folks who do. It's the pilot's watch of the line. Now, I've shown you the diver's watch. I've shown you the pilot's watch. Now we're going to look at the driver's watch. As launched in 1963, the Cosmograph Daytona initially, and I mean very initially, named the Rolex Le Mans, has grown to be possibly the most hyped watch in the collection as of 2019. Now, the ceramic bezel steel case you see here bowed at Basel World 2016. I was there, and folks were into it, but I never thought it would become the monster that it did. Over time, this watch doubled in price on secondary markets, with wait lists at some dealers up to two years long. Now, throwing this one on the wrist, it's easily the most elegant. I would say the Jubilee bracelet on the GMT is more dress-oriented, but the case of the Daytona 
absent a rotating bezel, absent a date complication, does manage to be considerably slimmer. It's about 12.2, 12.3 millimeters. And you can see that this version is the one I prefer. Black bezel and black dial. You're getting a black bezel either way. There's a white dial option, but for me, this watch has a more imposing presence on the wrist. It looks sportier. It looks like it has a larger dial. As a result, it looks like it is a larger watch. All of that while still fitting my spindly 16 centimeter circumference wrist. Okay. All cards on the table, I'm going with the Daytona. I'm not a diver, I'm not a pilot, but I am a driver, and I'm a big fan of endurance sports car racing. I'll never win one on the track at Daytona, but maybe someday I'll buy myself one. All right, friends in the box, I can see Eddie Landsberg asking, would you rather have a Pepsi, Batman, Hulk, Ceramic, Daytona, or Steel Sky Dweller? I would have to say Ceramic, Daytona of those, followed shortly by a Hulk, followed by a Steel Sky Dweller with the blue dial. And I can see right here, you're saying, but can't resell. That's the idea. We buy them to own them, not to sell them. And I can see we have Xavier N joining us from Manila. Thank you for getting up in the Philippines early in the morning to join me. And I can see we've got 53 Capri Drive joining me from Manhattan, darn close to my old stomping grounds in lower Manhattan at Cadwallader. And the knight in the Panther's skin saying, I truly love the date just with the Cyclops. We've got a date just on the table. You're going to be happy, man. All right, let's look at something completely different. So different, in fact, that it comes from an entirely different country. And an accessible sports watch. This is the Nomos Tangamat GMT. Launched in late 2012, it's a GMT watch with a 12 and 24 hour time zone uh, display system, but it also has a clever travel time system. So as you jump, so too does your time zone, and that will be represented at nine o'clock. So you can jump and the watch does all the math for you. We'll keep in track of where you are. On the case back, Nomos Caliber Zai. This is pre-swing system, in-house caliber with a Swiss escapement. Now the timepiece is approximately 40.5 millimeters, so it's on the larger side for Nomos. I'm going to throw it on the wrist. You can see that the Tangant and the Tangomat are defined by their sharp, geometrically formed lugs. You can see that they're straight as they exit the case, but when you look at them in profile, they are arced and kinked. And if you look at the watch head on, you can see that everything, the pusher adjuster for the time zone, the crown, the bezel, and the lugs are all designed in a one to one to one aspect ratio relative to each other. So they all have the same width. It's a remarkable consistent system that results in a wonderfully coherent aesthetic. A timepiece that I love and a timepiece that you can get for not a lot of money. That's the most attractively priced watch on the table. And since I teased it, I should share, uh, it's about three and a half thousand dollars and you get a German handmade luxury timepiece. Jumping right back into the chat box, I can see Dave Menzoza is joining us just now and Dee Fitzgerald saying Nomos kick ass. Adrian Cohen, Autobahn is the best Nomos. I agree, I would take the blue dial. Like I said, I'm all about driver's watches. Speaking of blue dials, we got a ceramic luxury dive watch shootout and it starts with a blue dive. Blue Dial, 2016, as that Daytona was being unveiled, so too was the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaf Ocean Commitment 2. No longer a chronograph, this one features a ceramic gray case, a ceramic blue bezel, and a sensational sunburst blue dial. 43 millimeters, this one's under 50 millimeters lug to lug, and it's about 13 and a half millimeters thick, which means this is a much more wearable watch than the standard 50 Fathoms, and you get the same movement, albeit with silicon hairspring and display case back. Three main spring barrels, five day power reserve, chronometer adjustment in six positions, 300 meters water resistant, 35 joules with a high horology finish. Everything you would expect on the likes of a high end Chagere Le Coult or Audemars Piguet, but you're getting it in a case that is sharply beveled, almost so sharply creased it looks like it could cut you. No crown guards, a little bit of a vintage vibe from the bathyscaphe, a stripped down 50 fathoms. Bezel. You can hear it's chunky. Okay, the response from the other side of the Valet du Jeu, they're actually not that far away from each other. Audemars Piguet offering us a 50 fathoms diver. The 15717 full ceramic, 42 millimeters in ceramic. These are both highly water resistant and scratch resistant watches. The ceramic makes them both wear far lighter than if they were steel, so they feel eyes closed like smaller watches. Now the full ceramic case also shakes off scratches, which is perfect because the offshores and the Royal Oaks are notoriously prone to scratching. Ceramic is the way to go. You could see the finish of the bezels, the bevels, the lug hoods, the case top, the case flank. You're getting the same finish 
finish as it flashes through the light that you get on a steel, gold, or platinum, or titanium royal oak, but you're getting it executed in ceramic. 300 meters water resistant. This one features the AP manufacturer caliber 3120, 60 hour power reserve, but you can see a full balance bridge and a gyromax style balance. This is a tough movement too. It's designed for the offshore and you can see the watch nicely blacked out with a few well chosen orange accents and an internal rotating ratcheting dive bezel. It's a wonderful piece if you just want to use the bezel to time something on the surface. I actually prefer a dive bezel to a chronograph because it's just easier to read. All right, jumping into our chat box real quick, we can say Brick Lane saying the, a the AP wear is rather nice. And watch issue saying great looking strap on that 50 Fathoms. It is blue sailcloth with vulcanized rubber on the underside. It is very comfortable. And I could see Mr. Escobar, my goodness, that Blancpain, I agree with you. That would be my choice of the divers on the table tonight, even over the Rolex. And I could see we have Adrian C's asking, Tim, ever have you ever tried a Cartier drive chronograph? Uh, I have had no such thing on the show or in my reviews. And then Andrew O'Connor asking, Timmy, have you ever seen the 38 millimeter bath scaff in person? I did. I saw the Revolution Magazine Anniversary Edition. So I have not seen the more common version. I've seen the rare one. It's a great look. It is for a smaller wrist. Okay, jumping straight into the high horology on the table. Let's... I'm going to save this one for the end. How about all three F.P. Jorn Vagabondage? Originally created as a 30th anniversary auction item in three examples for the Anticorum Auction House back in 2004, F.P. Jorn, at the urging of his clients, built 69 additional pieces of the Vagabondage, laterally the Vagabondage 1, in platinum. Ten more were made fully diamond paved. This one just platinum. Sometimes less truly is more. Vagabondage from the French, to aimlessly wander about or the act of vagrancy. It features a wandering minute and an hour jumper that takes hold of the hour at the turn of the hour and then follows it around a central balance. You can see that balance rotating away. Uh, this watch featuring a no-name movement in solid rose gold, twin mainspring barrels driving that power-intensive complication. Only 69 of these were made. You can see the old-style F.P. Jorn strap, not alligator on the bottom, and no spring tabs. This is the original strap that chipped with the watch. 43 millimeters lug to lug and only 35.9 millimeters across, 7.2 millimeters thick. This is a wonderfully wearable watch. The rarest of the three and the hardest to find. I should mention I've got all three on the table tonight. All three have matching serial numbers. So this is the most uncommon and the only one that I had not seen previously. Jumping into the two. The two broke new ground. By the way, note on the Vagabondage that it does not feature the name of the maker on the front. And you can see with the original watch, it has a rather tortue shaped case. That's because this movement was originally designed by F.P. Jorn for a CPCP series Cartier Tortue. They decided not to go with the movement. He kept the rights to it and later put it in the Vagabondage. The reason his name wasn't on the front was because initially, the first watch wasn't as accurate as he prefers to see. So the first watch did not meet his standards for accuracy. He didn't want his name on the front. As a result, it became something of a thing, and it became the common practice with these watches. The second watch in the series featured jumping hours and jumping minutes, as well as a power reserve indicator. And you can see that the watch still features a rose gold movement, this time a little bit better finished, and the movement itself has a name, 1509. The watch is a little bit bigger. I'm going to throw it on the wrist. It's about 2.5 millimeters larger lug to lug, and it's about half a millimeter thicker. You wouldn't notice unless you saw the two watches side by side. You could see the jumping hour and the jumping minute, and you could see the discs easily visible underneath a smoked sapphire on the dial side. Note that the bridge at center with the time is not symmetrical. Often missed when you casually observe this watch, it is a little bit oblong and off-center. Jumping to the three, easily the most dynamic, although the second one is my favorite. This was a series for 2017. The second watch came along in 2010. The first watch, 2005 to 2006. This watch came along in 2017. Like the second generation, 69 pieces in platinum, and 68 pieces in rose gold. You can see it features digital jumping seconds and digital jumping hours. We now have a radial display of minutes. We still have the power reserve indicator from the two, a remontoire de Galate constant force device used on this watch to jump the seconds. It's just like the deadbeat seconds on the Chronomet Optimum or the Tourbillon Souverain. And you can see the case back of this one a bit more interesting as the movement is just a little bit more visible. Still in rose gold, this is probably the best finished of the three. 
F.P. Journe had come a long way as a manufacturer. And I could see right here, we've got 215 people watching live. Stay with me, guys. Let's try to hit a new number. Bobby Smith joining from Chicago. And I could see Joshua Polanski saying, busy dial. I don't disagree. And then Chris G is saying, F.P. Jumping Second is one of the most impressive watches ever. And Steve Bowden says, you say jump and the watch answers, how high? Sky high. But I don't have a sky dweller on the table, so I'm going to jump to an overlooked Rolex sports watch that we should discuss more often quite honestly. This is the Rolex Yachtmaster, the original Yachtmaster. The model you see here launched at Basel World 2012. You see it has a steel case, 904L steel. It has a platinum bi-directional rotating yacht style bezel. It is a platinum bezel and then it has a sunburst blue dial. 40 millimeters, you can see this is not the Submariner's 40 millimeter case as the Yachtmaster has a much more elegant sculpted uh, sinuous case. The compound curves, the tapered lugs, it has the look of a Daytona. It has the look of a President or a Datejust. You could see next to the Daytona, the case profile of the Yachtmaster is almost identical. They're very similar to each other. The Yachtmaster has a grace and a lithe beauty that is not present in the present Submariner. Now, thrown it on the wrist, one feature I can endorse is that it is a slim timepiece, about half a millimeter slimmer than the Sub. Graceful on the wrist. It gives you everything you would want in a rotating bezel Rolex sports watch, and you can pick these up pre-owned for just under $11,000, so you're not gonna pay through the nose like you would with a Hulk, uh, to say nothing of the GMTs and the Daytonas. This is actually my preference. Between the Sub and the Yachtmaster, I prefer staying high and dry above the waves up on deck. I get cold in the water. And because I did say sky high, we have a Rolex pilot's watch or traveler's watch of an unconventional character. First launched as the reference 6262 and at the time not a datagraph, it beat the sub to market as the first mass produced Rolex rotating bezel sports watch. And in the mid 50s, it became both a date just and the choice standard issue of the US Air Force Thunderbirds aerobatic demonstration squadron. This is the date just turnograph, also known as the Thunderbird. It is the only mobile bezel datejust. You have a bi-directional aviator style bezel in white gold, the dial in chalk white. The turnograph is a sports watch, 36 millimeter datejust. This one features the gold bezel, the steel case, the oyster bracelet, and it's been out of production since about 2010. So it's a coveted discontinued reference. My nails are short from manicure for those videos I shoot for you guys. This one has a glorious date wheel and the date itself, if I could demonstrate this, Oh, poor me. I no longer have the nails for these kind of things. But it features a date that is roulette style, and it is an exceptionally expressive. There you can see the odds are red. It is an exceptionally expressive 36 millimeter watch. You can see on the wrist, traditionally sized, this is the size that Churchill and Eisenhower wore. It is definitely a man's watch, but a bit more discreet, versatile, and truly a sports watch. This is the way you can get a Rolex sports watch that literally no one is looking for, and of which very few folks are aware. Blue dials, white dials, and black dials, each one has its own unique charm, but this is an underserved, under-recognized, under appreciated and in my opinion future classic Rolex sports style watch. I also suspect that we're going to see the resurrection of the turnograph possibly at Basel World this year and I could see right here Steve Bowden saying down with manicures. Yeah, believe me, if I could do this whole thing with gloves I would cuz it would save me a heck of a lot of time with files and clippers. Okay, and then I have, as a 28 asking, is that Yachtmaster 200 meters like the sub? The sub is 300 meters, the Yachtmaster is 100, but the Yachtmaster has a trip lock crown. The standard 100 meter Rolexes have a twin lock crown. I suspect the Yachtmaster is underrated to protect the dignity of the sub. Now, jumping to a sports watch from an entirely different brand, geography, and aesthetic persuasion, this is the 1996 to 2005 IWC Pilot's Watch Doppel Chronograph 3717-3. It's a 42 millimeter steel Rattrapont chronograph using the Richard Hobring split second system invented in-house at IWC. This was the first widely available Rattrapont system following the original 3711 of 1993. The thing about this watch is it gives you a tank tough base caliber that's been entirely re-engineered and rebuilt by IWC. So you have all of the virtues of a 7750 with an in-house split second system, an old school Mark inspired pilot's watch dial. 42 millimeters, it's also smaller than current IWC pilot's chronographs. So on a small wrist like mine, 16 centimeters, you're gonna find this one wears well. 
old school in that it also says Der Doppel Chronograph on the back with solid case back, IWC engraved, and check it out, guys. The crown is the original fish crown, never replaced in service. These are hard to find. That's a wonderful watch. One of the latter examples has it features Luminova rather than Tritium from the factory. And I can see right here we have Brick Lane saying that is the best value IWC. Watch yourself saying is, he's saying watch yourself if there were a 40 millimeter 50 fathoms in general production, watch yourself says it would be game over, presumably for Rolex. High and Rising is saying that the gloves would make you look like you stole the watch is true and it would be out of character. I can see Amara saying, hey Tim, any thoughts on the new black ceramic Seamaster 300 meter? We're talking about the 43.5 millimeter ceramic titanium no date that just came out in January. I like it a lot and as soon as we get one, it'll be on the show. Let's jump into something a little bit different. From Giger Le Coul, this is one you can still pick up pre-owned for under $10,000 which is impressive because it was an $18,000 watch when new. 999 pieces in titanium. This is the Giger Le Coult Amvox DBS. It's a chronograph, but where are the pushers? Here's how the system works. The watch features an articulated case that pivots on ball bearings. And by pressing the case at 12 o'clock when it's on the wrist, you can start and you can stop the chronograph. By pressing it at six o'clock, you can reset the chronograph. Vertical clutch, column wheel, crisp to actuate, 65 hour power reserve, twin mainspring barrels. Look at that open dial. It features the look of a vintage Aston Martin dial. As you can see, 270 degrees calibrated with the bottom open, just like it would be on the tachometer or tachometer, I should say, or speedometer of a vintage Aston Martin from the David Brown era. And there's a locking system on the flank that lets you disengage the chronograph and prevent yourself from accidentally actuating. You could see that there's the speedometer style dial, there is a gas cap style crown, and the watch, though 44 millimeters in titanium, wears well on a small wrist, incredibly well. It's also beautifully loomed with floating numerals on a deep dial, skeletonized at the center so you can see the sapphire discs as they loom over the center of the movement itself. This is a wonderful watch and a rare piece. The most innovative chronograph of the 2000s. And I could see Thomas Burnett is impressed by that mechanism. Tony Soprano as well. And Brooklyn saying, Tim, you are a true JLC aficionado. Thank you so much. I still love the brand deeply. And as you guys know, I kept one JLC for my collection. Jumping across the border once again, we're talking Langa. We're talking the Richard Langa Pour Le Marit. The original 2009 200-piece limited edition in pink steel, or pink gold, I should say. That'd be quite a feat. This one is pink gold, 40.5 millimeters, but get very close to that dial, guys, because this is Grand Faux Enamel. That's right, Grand Faux Enamel and a Langa. Does it get better? It does. Caliber L044, it is a fusée. 636 pieces in a chain, one quarter of one millimeter wide. You can see, can we get super close to the movement, guys? You can see the chain moving between the barrel and the fusée. That chain, it's right in there. Like you'll see on a bicycle. It pulls a bigger and bigger ratio as it moves across the spiral-shaped fusée so that as the power discharges, the mechanical advantage of the barrel pulling the drivetrain increases. So the fusée, an old late Renaissance constant force device reborn at Langa in the Pour Le Merit series, delivering constant force to the escapement. And you could see three quarter bridge skeletonized, glasuta stripes. You could see hand engraved surfaces, free hand engraved, black polished swan's neck regulator, mirrored anglage on the edge of every bridge. You can see German silver in its golden auburn like hue, a combination of copper, nickel and zinc untreated and raw. You could see jewels set in, in screw-fixed chaton. All screws except the blackened ones because it has a few of those, but the blued screws are all kiln-fired, blue-oxidized. This is as good as it gets, guys. By the way, that chain, although a quarter of a millimeter thick with over 600 parts, it can support two kilograms of mass, and you could see that awesome movement. Possibly the toughest and butchest three-hand time-only watch you will ever encounter. 200 pieces in pink gold. This is a little giant with hidden complexity. Over 700 parts in this movement. And I could see right here, Blue Shark Buddha is a fan. And we could see right here, Brick Lane saying, very few watchmakers finish a watch off like Longa do. Joshua Polanski saying, next level finishing. Tony Soprano, wonderful Longa, and the back looks awesome. Steve Bodenaskin, is that rose gold? It is pink gold per Longa. All right, let's see what else we have on the table tonight. We've got plenty else on the table. Let's talk about the heyday of Sojem. You don't recognize the name Sojem? Well, that's because 
it was latterly known by the name of its founder, Roger Dubuis. This is the Homage 37. This is not pink, this is not rose gold, this is red gold. Look at that black lacquered dial, glossy, bright, exploding in the light. Look at that lacquered moon face, hand painted. Look at that by retrograde system with perpetual calendar. This is as good as it gets. Geneva Hallmark movement on the case back. That's right, not just Geneva Hallmark, caliber 5707. You can see it's based on the Breguet 8815 prior to that. That was known as the Longines L990. Twin mainspring barrels, high horology, ultra thin automatic, filigree style, rose gold, Roger Dubuis logo, and all of this, a Besançon Observatory chronometer, meaning it went through the French test at the observatory at Besançon to earn its chronometer certification as a fully cased watch, and it is a Geneva Hallmark movement with by retrograde perpetual calendar. Early Roger Dubuis has already moved out of the doldrums phase. These watches are no longer dirt cheap, but they are objectively quite affordable compared to what they should be worth. If we were paying for substance and not for names, these would already be runaways. They're not quite there yet, but they are on their way. The train has just about left the station and wearable on any wrist. Look at those gold cabochon hour indices lighting up as I move it through the light. This is Geneva watchmaking at its best. Okay, it has a challenger. Geneva watchmaking at its best. Part two, or part three after the Jorns, I guess. This, launched in 2016, is the Laurent Ferrier Galet Square Boreal. Steel! Do I have your attention? And 41 millimeters, it features a fully loomed brown dial. That is the nomenclature used. It is a brown dial, fully loomed hands, and as you can see, on the case back, a spectacular caliber FBN 229. This is the highest level of finishing. It doesn't bear the Poinçon de Genève, but it's at or above the level of some movements that have black polished, fully skeletonized half bridge for a balance featuring an overcoil hairspring, four interior angles inside that skeletonized bridge, a fifth interior angle over the center wheel, perfectly aligned Cote de Genève. You have a 22 karat gold guilloche cut winding mass, three day power reserve, double direct escapement. So you have a double direct impulse natural escapement, a silicon oscillator locking the system as each wheel in nickel phosphorus, completely unlubricated, independently impulses the escapement, or the balance, I should say. So this is effectively a direct impulse system inspired by Breguet's natural escapement. You have a silent, ratchet-borne, jeweled staff, bidirectional winding system. This is as good as it gets, and yes, it's adjusted in six positions, not the standard chronometer five. And look, you can see the ghosted name of the maker and vertical satin finish like brushed stainless steel across the dial. Throw it on the wrist, it's an imposing timepiece. This is a full-sized watch, not traditionally sized at 41 millimeters. It has real wrist presence, and again, fully loomed. Jumping onto the table, I've got two more watches for you. First, let's talk Chopard. From Fleurier comes Calete Fleurier. This is a COSC certified chronometer and it features the vaunted Calete Fleurier Q in a box. What does that mean? Well, it's effectively a Geneva Hallmark style standard for watches made in Fleurier, in Neuchâtel, specifically around Val de Travers. The movement featuring both COSC certification and chronofiable testing, which is essentially a version of this movement going into a three-week test of durability during which the movement is literally beaten to within an inch of its life. So that representative movement allows all of these to earn chronofiable certification. It also features the Calate Fleurier seal, which deals with chronometric performance, durability, and finish. Stacked mainspring barrels, two of them, 65-hour power reserve, 22-carat white gold micro rotor, 39-millimeter white gold case. This is the tech dial, which is open and skeletonized with black polished numerals and hour track. You can see the dial has incredible depth. This was a 2010 limited edition of 250 pieces. The Chopard LUC Tech Calate Fleurier throw it on the wrist, very traditionally sized. You can see this one wears easy on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. A wonderful cure for the common Calatrava. 
And jumping into the box, I can see uh, Joshua Polanski asking, is there an advantage to a micro rotor? Two big ones. One, it keeps the movement thinner because the rotor is in the same plane as the rest. Otherwise, you're going to have a bridge for the winding system and then on top of that, a rotor. Second, it keeps the entire movement open and visible like you would get on a manual wind. So it's more beautiful and it's thinner. Jumping into the last watch on the table, and I saved this one for last. This was a dream of mine. They say, don't meet your heroes. I met this one. It stood taller and bolder more handsome and dashing than I could ever have imagined. In the 50th anniversary of the Zenith El Primero, this is the 2011 Zenith El Primero Tourbillon Chronograph. Guys, can we get super close to that tourbillon regulator? You can see it features a tourbillon that looks like a flying tourbillon because the upper bridge is a second sapphire disc underneath the primary one. So it has a sapphire upper bridge that is completely transparent. It also features an exotic quick set date system. It keeps the date in a rotary display that orbits the tourbillon, and you can see how that date mechanism works. You can also see the tourbillon cage, which uniquely for an El Primero, they're generally mechanically finished. The tourbillon carriage itself is entirely hand finished. The watch in stainless steel is 44 millimeters in diameter, 100 meters water resistant, and as you can see this caliber 4035 gives you all of the action on the dial side. It's nicely made, but would you ever have believed that a stainless steel tourbillon, 100 meters water resistant, with a chronograph, would be available for under $40,000 pre-owned, nay, under $30,000 pre-owned. Throw it on the wrist, and though it's a bold 44, it's a friendly 44, as I can easily wear this watch. You can see, it has stance, it has presence, it has gravitas, but it does not overwhelm. It's big, not a big bully. It's a gentle giant. And again, a dream as spectacular as I imagined in my wildest. You get the beat of a tourbillon and the 10 beat per second El Primero. Guys, thank you for joining me tonight. Zenith El Primero with tourbillon. I can't beat that, folks. Stay tuned. Of course, we're back tomorrow with Brian Gothberg on Watchbox Studios. And I have a special watch giveaway coming for April. Don't forget. And remember, we're going to have an entry. It might include more friends than previously. Thanks so much. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.